Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Tuesday evening, my regular Tuesday slot, where we delve a little bit deeper into the technical side of nutrition and all its, and health in general, basically, and all its complexities. And we try and simplify those complex things into things that we can understand. And I've got to break it down so that I can understand. And by doing that, I can hopefully help others understand as well. Um, so we've been talking about vitamins, and we'll also throw in some minerals as well. And we know what they are. We, we, we always talk about them, but do we know what they actually are and what they actually do in our system? And last week, we spoke a little bit about vitamins in general, and I started getting into the, the vitamin Bs. Um, and we covered vitamin B1 last week. So I'm going to share my screen and get going with the next one. Let's get my goodies up and going. Slideshow from the beginning. Just get me out of the way over here. It's going to hide me all together. <clears throat> so I'm using a presentation that was developed from one of the universities and compliments of these four people. Um, and I thank them for their contribution and helping me in my presentation. So as I said, last week we spoke about B vitamins, specifically um, B1. But we know that there's more than just one vitamin B. Now, we figured out what the B1 does. Um, if you'd like to go back to last week's presentation, and you can see a bit more. And tonight, we're going to continue with vitamin B2, which the other name for that is riboflavin. So whenever you're looking at labels of any sort of product, any nutritional label or food label, you can check um, on the label, which we learned about a few weeks ago, what to look for, and you will see various names of vitamins and minerals that are included in the product. Sometimes they will say B1, sometimes they won't, sometimes they'll say B2, sometimes they'll say riboflavin. So that just lets you have an idea of what exactly is there. And the riboflavin is very important in energy production. Um, you know, it's the, the thing that most people complain about. They say that, um, average person going to the local GP complains about lack of energy, which means that their vitamin B levels are probably a bit low. Um, it's there to help with the, uh, the processing of carbohydrates, fat, and protein metabolism. It's there for the formation of antibodies and red blood cells. So it's a very important um, vitamin, this one. So therefore, cell respiration. And if you're not too sure what respiration is all about, take a plastic bag, put it over your head for probably no longer than about 30 seconds and see what happens. Now, if you don't have sufficient vitamin B2, that is essentially what's happening to your cells. So you need to make sure that your cells are breathing. Therefore, the maintenance of good vision, skin, nails, and hair. It helps to alleviate eye fatigue. So very good for driving, computer work, um, that sort of thing. So where do we find it? We find large amounts um, in dairy, in eggs, in meats. And this just goes to show you that vegans and vegetarians are lacking in vitamin B. You find small amounts in leafy green vegetables, enriched grains, etc. So they will get small amounts of vitamin B2, but they're not getting enough if they're not getting the dairy, the eggs, and the meats. So the recommendations for men are 14 to 70. Uh, men in the age groups of 14 to 70 is 1.3 milligrams per day. And women, about one milligram per day. If you're older than 70, then you need larger doses still. 
which you probably are not going to get from your food. They always say you don't need to take vitamin supplements if you have a balanced diet. But as we can see over here, in some cases, you're not going to get enough from your balanced diet. You need more. The only way to get more, apart from eating more, is to take a supplement. However, there are some warnings. Um, but fortunately, vitamin B2 is non-toxic at supplemental and dietary levels. So with anything, too much of anything is bad for you. But you've got to take significant amounts of B2 for it to have any bad effects on you. But the other thing is light can destroy the riboflavin. So when you purchase things like milk, you need to uh, keep it in opaque containers, which is why most, of, most milk is kept in plastic or cardboard containers. The indications that you've got a B2 deficiency are itching and burning eyes, cracks and sores in the mouth and lips. So um, let me just bring my picture up over here again. So if you're getting cracks and sores right about there, um, they often say it's related to stress, which it is, because when you're stressing, your vitamin B levels are dropping. And that's where these cracks and sores come from. You tend to end up with bloodshot eyes. And this is common in alcoholics because you'll see that vitamin B2 is a serious deficiency there. You end up with dermatitis. So that means um, skin problems, skin inflammation. Sometimes you've got oily skin. And often there are digestive disturbances as well. Now, who is at risk? People with cataracts are at risk. So I know our one local ophthalmologist does cataract surgeries every single week, sometimes twice a week. So there are a lot of people out there with problems. <coughs> Apologies. Um, people with sickle cell anemia. So this is a specific type of anemia that needs to be detected by your doctor through blood tests, but the vitamin B levels are low. Alcoholics, as I've said already, uh, alcoholics have big problems as far as nutrition is concerned. So the next one is B3, which is also known as niacinamide or just plain niacin. It's important in energy production as well, maintenance of the skin and the tongue, it improves circulation, it helps to maintain the nervous system, and it is, it's helpful in the health of the digestive tract. And there are two types, and one of them is the niacinamide or nicotinamide. I'm not really sure why they give them different names for the same thing, but I didn't make up the names. Um, it does not regulate cholesterol. You need something else for that. And niacin or nicotinic acid is highly toxic in large doses. Now, this would be in an isolate form, not in a vitamin B complex, because in a vitamin B complex, um, it's there in even doses and your body will utilize what it needs. The um, inositol hexaniacinate the supplement that gives the cholesterol regulation without the high toxicity. So there is a medication over there that has been developed um, with niacin that helps to regulate um, cholesterol, but on its own, it doesn't. So the recommendations, men of 14 and older need 16 milligrams per day. Women of 14 and older need 14 milligrams per day. And you're going to find it in these types of foods. Once again, we can see, especially with the salmon, that vegans and vegetarians are not getting sufficient. So therefore, they need to supplement. Warnings in doses of only 50 to 100 milligrams of nicotinic acid can cause dilation of blood vessels 
and potentially painful tingling, otherwise known as the niacin flush, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and long-term liver damage. So they do do certain tests at times to bring up this niacin flush, um, to check certain medical conditions, which I'm not going to get into tonight, but this is done under controlled circumstances and very short term. So you shouldn't um, do this on a regular basis because that's where the damage comes about. Nicotinamide is almost always safe to take, although a few cases of liver damage have been reported in doses of over 1,000 milligrams per day. So this is mega doses. Um, you're probably going to need to take pretty much an entire bottle of vitamin B supplement to get to this sort of um, dosage, or you've got to take an isolate. So the V3 deficiency leads to things like pellagra. Um, and fortunately, this is quite rare in Western societies. It was fairly common in the prisoner of war camps back in the, war, in the last World War because they weren't getting sufficient vitamin B because they were being fed on polished rice, not raw rice. Um, also leads to gastrointestinal disturbances and a loss of appetite. People tend to have headaches, suffer from insomnia and mental depression. They're always fatigued and their bodies are wracked in aches and pains. So if any of these symptoms sound vaguely familiar to you, maybe whoever is complaining about them needs to get onto a vitamin B supplement. But remember, a B complex. They also tend to be very nervous and irritable. I think there's a lot of people in some departments that we have to deal with on a regular basis that possibly need some of these supplements. Now, who's at risk? Most people get plenty of B3 from their diet because it is added to white flour. So in, mo in most cases, you're going to get sufficient. But as we've said with these symptoms, some people are not getting sufficient for whatever reason. Now, the next one, B6, is also known as pyridoxine. And this is important in the production of red blood cells and the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. Um, tryptophan is a, um, one of your enzymes. Um, the, it's also important for immunity and nervous system functions and reducing muscle spasms, cramps, and numbness. And it's there to help to maintain proper balance of sodium and phosphorus in the body. Because if either of, either of those things get out of balance, remember, nature loves balance. And if any nutrient is out of whack, you are going to be in trouble. So the recommendations for men, 14 to 50, are 1.3 milligrams per day. And those over 50 is 1.7. Ladies, 1.2 and 1.3. And ladies over 50, 1.5. And this is the sort of diet that you'll be able to find these things in. Now, the warnings, high doses of B6 may be recommended to treat PMS, carpal tunnel syndrome, and sleep disorders. But continued use of high doses may result in permanent nerve damage. So please do this in conjunction with a registered dietitian and or an enlightened um, physician who can watch you and monitor you. I know Dr. Jim McAfee has spoken about uh, helping people with carpal tunnel by putting them on vitamin B. We, I think it was two tablets a day, two of our tablets, just by the way, a day for 12 weeks. Uh, um, according to him, any less didn't work, any more had counteractive um, effects coming in. So 12 weeks was found to be the optimum time period to have your higher doses of the B. Pregnant women should always consult their doctor before taking the supplement and all others. Um, again, my recommendation here, having dealt with um, gynees, they are not that well versed in nutrition unfortunately. So 
my suggestion here is if you know somebody who's pregnant and is wanting to take some supplements, they rather shouldn't ask their doctor about what supplements they can take because the doctors tend to prescribe the last supplement that was recommended by the last medical rep. And if it was medical reps recommending them, they probably are synthetic. Rather, they should ask their doctors what they may or may not eat. And then we have got a better idea of what to recommend from a supplement perspective. Vitamin B deficiency results in things like nervousness, insomnia, loss of muscle control, muscle weakness, arm and leg cramps, water retention, so those with badly swollen legs, etc. Skin lesions, so you'll find um, sores and uh, cuts and little wounds that are not caused by any other known effects or problems or not healing very well. Now, who's at risk? It's very rare that anybody is at risk of being low on B6, but alcoholics are always at risk in this case. Patients with kidney failure are also at risk. Women using oral contraceptives are also at risk. And the next one is B12, also known as cobalamin. And this is important in proper nerve function, production of red blood cells, metabolizing fats and proteins, prevention of anemia, DNA reproduction, so in other words, very important, and energy production. And in men and women, you're needing two to three micrograms per day. Again, from this little um, description over here of the types of foods, you will find that vegans and some vegetarians would be at risk as well. So vegetarians need to look for fortified sources um, like soy milk and supplements. And elderly often have trouble absorbing. So that's absorbing across the board, both food, medication, as well as supplements. So B12 deficiency leads to things like anemia, nerve damage, hypersensitive skin. Um, again, those at risk are those people with pernicious anemia. Now, I'm not gonna get into all these fancy diseases and conditions right now. Um, I think I'm going to leave that for next year, I might expand on a few of these sort of conditions um, and what one can utilize in various cases like that. I think it might be quite an interesting little um, experience there. B12 injections are often taken regularly. Um, and the trouble with this is it is just a vitamin B12. They forget about the other seven vitamin Bs. And it's usually in a synthetic form. So yes, it gets injected intramuscularly, which means it's a slow release, but you still are overpowering the other seven vitamin Bs. People who have got HIV are at risk for a lot of things and are quite often low in a lot of nutrients as well. People with chronic fatigue syndrome definitely need vitamin B. Now, the next one, I suppose we're not going exactly alphabetically, but um, we are now going to talk about vitamin A. So vitamin B is probably the more common vitamin, um, but vitamin A is also very, very important. But what is it? It is fat-soluble, whereas the vitamin Bs are water-soluble. So fat-soluble means that there can, in theory, be a toxic upper level. It's also known as retinol. And, um, or should I say, retinol is one of the most active and usable forms of vitamin A, and it is found in animal and plant sources. But what does it actually do? It's very good for vision. So people with bad eyesight quite often um, are low in vitamin A, and specifically those with night blindness are usually found to be low in vitamin A. It generates pigments for the retina. It maintains the surface lining of eyes. It's very good for bone growth. 
as well as reproduction, cell division and differentiation, and obviously reproduction is entirely uh, comes about through cell division and differentiation, and it's good for healthy skin as well, as well as regulating your immune system. But where do we find it? What is it found in? Generally found in animal sources. Again, vegans and vegetarians are at risk. Things like eggs, meat, cheese, milk, liver, kidney, cod, halibut fish oil. Now, have a look at that little list. How many of those things are you eating on a daily or regular basis? Out of the I can count two that I eat, I would say daily, uh, three. Three items on there I would eat daily. Um, eggs I have occasionally, not daily. The others, definitely not. So the plant sources, you'll find it in things like carrots, sweet potatoes, cantaloupe, pink grapefruit, apricots, broccoli, spinach, pumpkin. Um, have a look at those names over there and see which ones you recognize as being a good source of carotenoids as well. <clears throat> now, what do these plants have in common? Most of them are orange or yellow in color. Don't think the spinach is, but the rest can be. Beta carotene is a precursor of vitamin A. And it is masked in some green plants. But how much is enough? In children, they're needing between 2,000 to 3,500 IU or international units is what that, um, those letters stand for. Men need about 5,000 IU. Women need about 4,000 IU. Now, what are your signs of deficiency? Night blindness is a key one. Decreased resistance to infection. So people who often get sick are usually low in vitamin A. They tend to have extremely dry skin, hair, or nails. It gets very brittle and nasty as well. Now, who is at risk for deficiency? Quite often young children, and I think the um, World Health Organization is on a, a spree at the moment in injecting young children with vitamin A in order to boost their levels. Children with inadequate health care, and that's why they go out to do this, because it's usually um, people in countries who which are at war regularly, so they're not um, eating properly, their diets are bad, and they don't really have access to good health care. You know, we almost take it for granted that you're not feeling well, pick up the phone, contact your local GP, and all being well, you'll have a gap, you go in and see him today or tomorrow, and you get sorted. There are some people who never see a doctor in the entire life because they just don't have access to that sort of care for various different reasons. Adults in countries with high incidences of vitamin A deficiency or measles, adults or children with diseases of the pancreas, liver, intestines, or inadequate fat digestion absorption because, because it's a fat soluble vitamin, um, it gets absorbed into the um, fatty areas of the body, like your liver. And if you're not um, absorbing that fat correctly or digesting it, you're not going to be getting your vitamin A. But remember, as I said, vitamin A is fat soluble, therefore, it ha can have a compound or a buildup effect. So um, hypervitamin, vit vitaminosis A is a fancy term for too much. Vitamin A leads to to toxic symptoms such as dry, itchy skin, headaches and fatigue, hair loss, liver damage, blurred vision, loss of appetite, skin coloration. Any and all of these are symptoms that can be related to numerous other things. So please, if you or, or anybody you know complains of symptoms like this, let them go to their doctor 
be checked out properly. So check all the vitals and do blood tests to check and see if you suspect excess vitamin A, they need to know to do blood tests to check specifically for that. Other side effects, especially in um, pregnant moms, can cause severe birth defects. So don't mess with this. Women of childbearing age, age should not consume more than 8,000 IU per day. Retin A, which is an acne cream, or Accutane, which is a, an acne tablet, can also cause birth defects. Retinol is a most dangerous form because the body will not convert as much beta carotene to vitamin A unless needed, but it can still be harmful. So we know from our training that beta carotene and carotenoids um, are good precursors to vitamin A and your body will convert what it needs or the amount of vitamin A that it needs to convert from um, beta carotene and carotenoids. But diabetics cannot convert it and therefore need to supplement with extra vitamin A. Skin can also take on a yellow or orange glow. And this was something I remember from way back in the early days that people who took too much um, of the beta guard tended to end up with yellow hands. Most cases of vitamin A overdose occur from supplements, but can occur from diet, although it is very rare. The RDA is um, considered. RDA is considering establishing an upper limit. So they're working on an upper limit for the amount of vitamin A that you need. So foods that are high in, in vitamin A are things like liver and fortified milk. Um, foods that are high in beta carotene are your carrots, your carrot juice, your mango, sweet potato, spinach, cantaloupe, and vegetable soup. So if you look at that, you can get a pretty good idea of where you're going to find your vitamin A. So if you're eating these things, make sure you're not supplementing in excess as well. Um, this I found interesting. Just a bit of trivia for you. One ounce of polar bear liver contains enough vitamin A or retinol to kill a person. Now, why are you going to be eating the liver of a polar bear? I'm not sure, but it's not recommended. Um, vitamin A, beta carotene, and cancer. Now, surveys suggest that diets rich in vitamin A and beta carotene can lower the risk for cancer, especially lung cancer. However, one study was stopped because subjects with increased beta carotene had a 46% higher risk of dying from lung cancer. <clears throat> now, one thing that they did neglect to mention with this whole thing was that when they did the study, they were using synthetic beta carotene. They were not using food sourced beta carotene. And that was where the problem came about. Another study showed that smokers were more likely to develop lung cancer if they took beta carotene supplements. Again, synthetic beta carotene supplements, not food based supplements. Beta carotene supplements are not advisable except in rare situations. Um, again, food based is different. And that's where I'm going to stop this week because I'd like to give a chance for a little bit of QA. And we've got about seven minutes left. Does anybody have any comments or questions before I stop my recording? Um, uh, vitamin D injections, how long do they stay in the bloodstream? Do you have an idea? I think they last upwards of about a month. I'm under correction, oh, but I, oh, yeah. yeah, because it's a slow release, so it lasts upwards of about three to four weeks. Okay, I've always wondered. And just another thing, mm -hmm. um, in a Lifestyle magazine long ago, there were, a couple of years ago, there was an article on studies that were done that shown that people who lack vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 had a much uh, higher chance of getting dementia. Correct. So it has... A Apparently, it's very good for brain. That's when I was really serious about my vitamin B. 
I mean, I Good. need that. Good. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people at the moment with dementia, uh, elderly people who get admitted to hospital for surgery or um, illnesses often end up with dementia. And I think part of that reason is because the medications and things tend to deplete their system of vitamin B. And therefore, they develop that dementia as a result. Mm. I don't have any scientific backup on that one, but that is the theory that I'm that I'm seeing or working on because of what I'm seeing um, in and around hospitals. Mm. Sean, um, yes. I heard of uh, cases where people, uh, elderly people, were quite fine before and up, and they come back, and the, uh, the anesthetic has turned them completely, and now they've got dementia. Correct. I, I, I have seen that personally on quite a few occasions. Whether it is yeah. the anesthetic that does it, whether it is the yeah. shock of the surgery that does it, or whether it is oh, okay. some of the other um, sedatives and things that they often use, I don't okay. know. But oh. I have noticed that where I'll see a patient before surgery, I'll chat to them, they're very with it, they talk sense and everything else and directly yeah. post up they, they seem to have lost it and they no, are very confused have dementia and it's it's a bit of a pitiful sight but from yes. what I've seen is that once they're out of hospital and all the medication has um, been, a, been able to be uh, biodegraded out of their system they do tend to come right again yeah, well, I've heard people who didn't go right at all and went the other way completely. Correct. I have a friend's, uh, a friend's mom. She said at first she had an up for something and uh, she came out, she was okay. They had to reoperate for some, some stupidity. She came out, she was never the same and she died of dementia. Yeah. Completely died of Alzheimer's. She was absolutely, completely gone and the up did it. Weird, eh? Yeah. No, that happens. And it's everybody's affected differently. It is. It's quite scary. Everybody's affected differently. Yeah. Right. I'm going to stop okay. recording.